Let's turn now, friends, as the Lord would help us, to the chapter we read, Luke chapter 1. And in verse 13, we read, The angel said to him, Zacharias, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. <clears throat> Last week we saw the arrival of the angel Gabriel, signalling a huge change in the um, life in Israel, and indeed a huge change for the whole world eventually. Now, strangely, the Jews didn't seem, my reading of the scriptures, to expect anyone like John the Baptist to introduce the Messiah to them. They were eagerly waiting for the Messiah himself, but they, they had been waiting for centuries for the Messiah. Now, although they were waiting for Elijah, we know that, it didn't seem to be in the capacity of a forerunner. In fact, it's very hard to understand what, they're still waiting for Elijah, by the way, at uh, every Passover observed in Israel today, there is always an empty chair waiting for Elijah. Now, what role exactly they expect Elijah to take, I'm not altogether sure. However, the promise of a forerunner was the very last promise God gave Israel in the Old Testament, just before he imposed the 400-year silence upon them. First of all, in that promise, it seems to be the Messiah himself who's speaking. Malachi chapter 3, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. So that seems to be the Messiah that is speaking with regard to that promise. But then the second part of the promise seems to come from God himself in chapter 4 of Malachi. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, these words, Elijah the prophet, that's not Elijah the Tishbite. The name Elijah was merely borrowed as a title for the forerunner. So Gabriel rightly interpreted Malachi's words but the Jews rejected that interpretation. And so they left, even till this day, waiting for Elijah. Now, one other matter deserves noting uh, in this chapter. And that's the impact Gabriel's visit made on that generation. In Luke 1 and 2, we discover four distinct songs. Songs, or if you prefer, poems that were compiled in recognition of the arrival of the forerunner and of the Messiah. The first of these, known as the Magnificat, this is called Mary's Song, this is in chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. The second one is Zechariah's song or poem, again in chapter 1 here, verses 67 to 79. The third one is in the following chapter, and it's the song of the angels in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 2. And the third one is the song or poem of Simeon, again in chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Now, those songs were compiled and uh, sung or recited, if whatever you prefer, to signal a celebration of the end of the 400-year silence and also the end of the spiritual darkness, the appalling, uh, oppressive spiritual darkness that had plagued their forefathers for 400 years. So let's look then, first of all, this evening at 
Gabriel's prediction in verses 14 through to 17. Now, it's possibly true that most Christians, if they think about these things at all, they limit John the Baptist's role in these events to his ministry at the River Jordan, to baptizing Christ, and to declaring a few days later, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, these were obviously a certain part of his role, yet Gabriel, <coughs> excuse me, Gabriel didn't mention any of that here. Isn't that strange? The first thing he told Zechariah in verse 14, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, <coughs> and many shall rejoice at his birth. Well, how true that was for Zechariah and for Elizabeth, but also for others. We read in first verse 58, her neighbors and cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And isn't it true that the news that Gabriel brought to this old couple, it has also brought joy to ourselves when we read it even 2,000 years later. So I think uh, Zechariah's message had a far wider vision than the immediate family that he was speaking to here. It includes ourselves and includes believers in all ages because we rejoice in the birth of the forerunner, perhaps not as much as in the birth of our Saviour, but nevertheless, we do rejoice that John the Baptist was brought into the world. And we know from Malachi that the, John, uh, the Baptist's arrival was an essential preliminary step to the arrival of Messiah. In other words, if John hadn't come, there would be no Messiah. It was as, as essential as that. So, <coughs> excuse me, is another reminder to us of the faithfulness of our God to each and every covenant promise that he gave. When he promised the forerunner uh, 400 years before this, how many of the children of Israel or anybody else living within their borders? How many remembered? How many knew about these promises? I would suggest to you, precious few. Precious few. But the promise stood because God is faithful to every promise he gives us. So Gabriel told Zechariah, verse 15, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, we should note that. It doesn't say he shall be great in the sight of men, although he was. Jesus tells us there's none greater in the prophets than John the Baptist. But that's not what Zechariah is saying here. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And isn't that what counts for all of us? What we are in God's sight, not what we are in the sight of men. But John the Baptist wasn't great by birth or by genealogy or by worldly riches or by any kind of grandeur. He was great by his love to God. He was great by his faithfulness to God. He was great by his unwavering commitment to what God had called him to do. That's how he was great. And that's how we can be great in the eyes of God, if not in the eyes of anybody else. And then Gabriel stated, He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, which is verse 15, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. <clears throat> now, I struggle a little bit with this because... Some people call John a Nazarite from the womb. There is such a thing in the Bible as a Nazarite from the womb. But it's not clear to me that John was a Nazarite from the womb. Certainly he was born again in the womb. That's not necessarily the same as a Nazarite from the womb. We have the details on 
conditions that pertain to the Nazarite of the womb in the book of Numbers and chapter 6 and in the closing verses of that book, and or that chapter rather. And it stipulates three things that to me don't seem to apply to John the Baptist. It says that he must drink no alcohol. Now, I don't know whether John drank alcohol or not. But it also says no razor must touch his head. In other words, he mustn't cut his hair. Well, we're not aware that that applied to John the Baptist. And a third stipulation, he must never touch a dead body of any kind. Now, we're not aware that that applied to John the Baptist either. So I'm not altogether sure that we should call him a Nazarite from a womb. But be that as it may, Gabriel evidently meant that this baby was to be consecrated to God from his mother's womb. He would be consecrated to God in his ministry and he would be consecrated to God in his life. And he was so consecrated to God that he lived a life of such great obedience that it actually cost him his life. His refusal to accept the adultery of a ruler, as we know, led to his execution. So John the Baptist was a very, very special baby. Then Gabriel predicted in verse 16, many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord. Now here's what the faithful remnant needed to hear. Not only that God was going to visit them, but that he was going to visit them with power, that a time of revival was going to be experienced by the Jews. And John the Baptist would be used by the Holy Spirit to challenge, when he began ministering in the wilderness, to challenge multitudes of people wallowing in their sin, people whose lives reflected the spiritual darkness of the day in which they lived. And in the fullness of time, he would begin that ministry in the wilderness. Now, I'm, I'm stressing that because it's in contrast to how the modern Christian church contemplates new ministries, new congregations, new areas of working the gospel. This is not where we would think of starting a new work or sending a missionary to a wilderness. Churches usually focus on large population centers, cities, towns, where there are lots of people. Not a wilderness. But we read in Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, we know that in that wilderness, only scattered nomads lived. And yet, when John began preaching, probably to one here and two there, in the fullness of time, God gathered people to him. He brought them from the north, south, east, and west to sit under the ministry of this man. And he had more success than numerous prophets before him and some evangelists after him. Out of nowhere, he began preaching. People began listening, sitting under the sound of the gospel coming from the mouth of John the Baptist and even achieving something that people never thought would happen. And we'll touch on this perhaps next week. Jews being willing to be baptized. Jews were never baptized. Only Gentiles who came into their fellowship had to be baptized. Jews never needed baptism. They were clean in their own eyes. But those who sat under this man's preaching, they were baptized. And we see some of that 
at the river Jordan. Now, this is a two-sided coin. When God blesses a gospel work, it's a two-sided coin. And it is a two-sided coin that has to be always in vogue in the Christian church. On the one side, we have men sent from God to preach the everlasting gospel. That's hugely important. Preachers ought to be and should be men sent of God. This is not a vocation people can choose. I know that's happening in parts of the church. This is a vocation that comes from above. Men sent from God to preach the everlasting gospel. That's on one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is the need for the Holy Spirit to convict and to convert people wallowing in their sin. So there's much here, my friends, to encourage ourselves, even if our situation is so very different from the situation John the Baptist found himself in. You know, when I was preparing this, I was thinking, is it really that different? Our situation and his situation. Don't we have, more than ever today, multitudes of people wallowing in their sin, no longer attending church, whose lives are in spiritual darkness, whose minds are ignorant of the gospel of redeeming grace? They're all around us, more than ever, since the gospel came to our island. And don't we also need the Holy Spirit to be poured upon us to convict these multitudes of their sin and of their need to come to places like this to hear the gospel being preached to them? And don't we also need preachers to be sent of God as ambassadors for Jesus Christ? Oh, yes. Our situation is very like the situation John the Baptist found himself in. Now, I don't want to take anything away from John because Jesus reminds us there's none greater than John the Baptist. But nevertheless, John the Baptist could never, ever have converted one single Jew to God without the help of the Holy Spirit. No preacher can. No preacher can, my friends. He did what he did as an instrument in the hand of the Holy Spirit. So, here's a vacant congregation. And over the past few years, or two or three years at least, maybe, I can't remember, time is passing that quickly since the congregation became vacant. We've been thinking about a minister. And we've made an attempt a couple of times to send for somebody. But who are we going to send for? Who are we going to look for? The tendency is, is to look for someone that we think is suitable. Perhaps an eloquent preacher. Perhaps an able, charismatic preacher. Oh, if we got that fellow, what a difference it will make. No, my friends, it has to be a man sent of God, a man equipped by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in this place and in other places as well. Because if the Holy Spirit isn't with the man you're going to send for, there will be no change in this congregation, my friends. We need that spirit today more than ever. The spirit that used men in the past, like the apostles themselves, to turn the world upside down. And we know that he brought such men to these communities of ours in the past, powerful preachers, and that they preached in the power of the spirit and they saw the results of it. Let me move on to look at John the Baptist as a forerunner. Verse 17, he shall go before him in the spirit and power 
of Elias or Elijah. Now, these words refer us back to the promise of Malachi 4, verse 5. Now, it's not altogether clear to me, and uh, I struggled with this quite a bit over the years, why God chose to make this parallel between Elijah and John the Baptist. On the face of it, it seems to be, well, rather confusing. And certainly the peers of uh, John the Baptist, they found it confusing. They couldn't understand the parallel between the two. Elijah, as we know, lived centuries before John the Baptist was even born. He lived during the time of evil King Ahab. And we don't believe in reincarnation. Calvin, the commentator, he offers the best theory that I came across as an explanation for this. He says that the time of Elijah was similar, if not identical, to the time John the Baptist. Baptist was born. And Elijah, he says, saw extremely dark times. Truth had fallen in the street. The worship of God was utterly corrupted. And most prophets were false prophets. Most of them were followers of Baal. And God's cause was at rock bottom. And then God used this man, Elijah, to revive and to restore the cause of God. He brought the people, in other words, back to the Bible. And he challenged and condemned the army of false prophets, as we know from that amazing scene uh, on the top of the mountain. And Elijah, he says, also transformed the social and domestic life of Israel by reintroducing the rightful place of God's law Ungodly behavior declined. Religious interest, on the other hand, improved. And people became serious about God in their lives. Now, these are always the results, my friends, of having God's law central to life. And that's what John the Baptist, in part at least, would achieve when he began preaching in the wilderness. He preached the law. He preached the law. It's through the law that there is knowledge of sin. So if we read as we do of the uh, conviction and the repentance of many, many Jews under John's preaching, he must have been preaching the law as much as perhaps even more than the gospel. Hence he told them, that is Jesus told them, if you will receive it, this is Elijah which was to come. This is Elijah which was to come. Now Gabriel emphasized this as part of Messiah's role. He would, verse 17, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the judge of the just. These are a sample of the numerous benefits that Jesus Christ and his gospel and the law of God in its right place, these are some of the samples that show us what God can do in the lives of individuals, in communities, in churches, and entire nations. And that is still the case. Now, I want to highlight one important issue here in connection with God's law. And that's the role of the fifth commandment. The commandment to honor our parents. When that commandment is emphasized in society, children grow up or are more likely to grow up to honor their parents and to respect their fellow citizens. However, when the fifth commandment is ignored or is rejected, what happens? Family life disintegrates. Family life disintegrates. And that is a reality that is far too common to ourselves in modern society. 
more and more, you will see children growing up not respecting their parents and becoming feral in society. And that's exactly where we are today, even in our beloved island. So in spiritually dead times, the hearts of the fathers, as it's put here, are all too often turned away from their children. Turned away from their children. The opposite of what the angel is here promising that John the Baptist would do. And furthermore, the kindest and most generous father fails in his duty as a parent if he doesn't make those children aware of God. Well, meanwhile, Gabriel continues in verse 17, and the disobedient, he says, to the wisdom of the just. In other words, Jesus the Messiah would address this lawless people and the lawless ways in which they live and direct them to himself as saviour. He is the wisdom of the just. Now, having said all of that, my friends, none of these wonderful blessings were to usurp the primary mission John was given in this life and in this role, the mission to introduce Jesus to the people, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So through his preaching, John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy we read in Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And as his ministry moved from the wilderness to the river Jordan, his role as a forerunner was complete. He had done what God had called him to do. And what a blessing, my friends, if we do what God has called us to do. What a blessing. We are all called, my friends, to undertake certain duties in this life, be it in the church, be it in the home, be it in society and in the world. We're all called to undertake certain duties. And we are to strive for perfection. We are to strive for perfection, even though we know we shall never be perfect. We are to strive after perfection. We are to strive for loving God and our neighbor with all our heart, soul, and mind, even though we know we'll never achieve it as we ought to. Here's God's ultimate challenge. Quite apart from loving our neighbor, quite apart from the numerous duties given to us in the world, we are to be holy. This is how Peter puts it. 1 Peter 1, 6. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's the grand objective in every Christian's life. The grand objective. Striving after holiness every single day. Even though we know we will never be as holy as we ought to be whilst we are in this body of death. We still to strive after it. And when our effort is sincere, when our intention is God glorifying, there is immense satisfaction, my friends, as some of you know, immense satisfaction if we know that we genuinely try even if we fall short, even if we have to confess at the end of every day, we are unprofitable servants. Let me look thirdly at John the Baptist acknowledging the Messiah. Now we know who was first to be called to follow Jesus. We know who was first to make a public profession of Jesus as the Saviour Messiah. We even know who was first to see him after he rose in his 
resurrection. But there's a special first that belongs to John the Baptist. When Elizabeth discovered her pregnancy, some questioned her conduct. We read verse 24. I'm going to refer here to some verses we didn't read in the interest of time. Verse 24, she conceived and hid herself five months. Now, some suggest to us that she hid herself to hide the shame of her pregnancy. Being pregnant in old age possibly would have been, no doubt it would have been a thing of shame in those days. And those who are of this view quote verse 25, uh, to take away my reproach among men, is what she said. But there's another interpretation of her response. And that is this. She isolated herself from everyone to be alone with God. Not to hide her shame. There was no shame. To be alone with God because she wished to meditate in the deepest fashion on all that Gabriel had brought into her life. Now in the eyes of her peers, Elizabeth knew that they believed she had failed in the role of motherhood, a very important matter for people in Israel. Whereas now, all that has changed through God's gracious intervention. The great prize of womanhood in Israel is now hers. He has taken away that reproach, that criticism, that censure, that sense of shame if there, were, if there was that with Elizabeth. So she desires to ponder over this great blessing and the implications of it in her life. Now, when I was preparing this, I was thinking, we could call this a five-month sabbatical. A five-month sabbatical. If you like, an exaggerated form of what Jesus asks you and me to do from time to time. Doesn't he ask us to go from time to time into the closet, shut the door, shut out the world, and do your business with God. This is what that is. This is what, 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 what the meaning of it. It's an exaggerated form of going into the closet, shutting out the world, to contemplate on God himself. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's cousin Mary recently told by Gabriel of her own pregnancy, heard of Elizabeth's experience. And again, verse 39, we read, Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. God was going to use her to bring Elizabeth's isolation, her domestic isolation, to an end. And when she entered Zechariah's home, Mary greeted the six-month pregnant Elizabeth and she greeted her with these words. And immediately, we read in verse 41, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, that is John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. How incredible is that? This is so utterly amazing, it's hard for us to grasp. Mary is only a few days pregnant. Her baby hasn't even yet taken any recognizable form. Elizabeth, she's only six months pregnant, yet her baby leapt in her womb. He leapt in her womb. But in recognition of what? Experts tell us that there are three stages in very early pregnancy. Germinal, embryonic, 
and fetal. These are the three stages in very early pregnancy. The baby in Mary's womb wasn't even yet an embryo. Not even yet an embryo. In medical terms, it's just a mere cluster of cells and tissue. But Elizabeth's baby, my friends, he didn't leap in the womb at a what? He leapt in her womb at a who. Not at a what, but at a who. In some mysterious way, God the Holy Spirit conveyed to the unborn babe in Elizabeth's womb that he was in the presence of the incarnate Son of God, even though he hadn't yet developed to the embryonic stage of pregnancy. How amazing is that? But even at that early stage of cells and tissues, he still possessed personhood. He still possessed personhood. He was a person, albeit in the form of cells and tissue. Uh, we can imagine the crucial teaching here <clears throat> on the subject of abortion. I haven't got time to go into that at this time, but maybe will some other time. But this is crucial to any argument against aborting babies in the womb. So what the Holy Spirit <clears throat> implanted in Mary's womb, the seed form of a human nature that's already inseparably united to the person of the Son of God in heaven. Now let me close with this. If the unborn John the Baptist acknowledged the as yet unborn and formed baby Jesus in the womb, what excuse can anybody have for not acknowledging, believing, trusting, and worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ? who now rules at God's right hand. What excuse could anybody possibly have? You know, my friends, excuses send multitudes to hell every day. Multitudes. Whereas faith in all its simplest form, faith, grace, trust, and love can carry us all the way through this life into the Father's house of many mansions to rest in the bosom of our God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank thee once again for thy patience and thy tolerance and foreboding with us. We thank thee that Thou dost mark iniquity against us, but rather tolerating us in our sinnership, in our ignorance, in the pathetic manner in which we try to understand the great mysteries of Scripture. Help us, O Lord, to believe even that which we cannot understand, even that which we cannot presently lay hold of for whatever reason. Grant that the Spirit would implant that faith in our souls and that our hearts would be enlivened and that we would see something of thy glory working in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand to receive the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.